Hello, and welcome to the Nicole Mason Show, the show where we bring up women who are movers and shakers, trailblazers, to share about their victories, their trials, and triumphs over those trials, to share success stories and strategies, and who uh, know what it's like to climb up the rough side of the mountain <clears throat> as it relates to a ministry and marketplace. And today, I am so super excited to welcome to the Nicole Mason Show, one of my dear sisters and friends who is a powerful woman of God doing some great work, not just in the community, but in her own family, because we understand that ministry starts at home and we want to talk about that. But let me read just a, a short piece of her extensive bio. Um, Vanessa Antrim is the daughter of William and Christine Holly. She is currently the primary caregiver for her parents. She was born and raised in Washington, D.C. Vanessa has always been a goal-oriented person, and this was realized in her educational career. She graduated from the 11th grade from the Academy of the Holy Names in Silver Spring, Maryland. She then went to Allegheny College in Meadville, Pennsylvania, and graduated with honors in three years with a BA in sociology and speech communications. In 1984, she received her master's degree in social work, social service administration from Howard University. Okay, we have to put a pin right here. H-U. H-U, no. you know. <laughs> Vanessa retired from the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene after 30 years of service in 2016. And, um, she is the co-owner with her husband, Thomas, of a and a Professional Services, LLC. It is there she has used her organizational skills to plan events, bus trips, and desktop, desktop, desk, wait, let me get my words right, desktop publishing for individuals and business businesses in Washington, D.C., um, metropolitan area. Uh, Vanessa loves the Lord and gives him all the glory for bringing her through all that she has been through. She has been a member of Great Amount Calvary Holy Church for over 35 years, where she accepted the Lord as her Lord and Savior. It is at Calvary where she met many of her lifetime friends. She has served in many capacities, captain of the Associate Missionary Board, advisor of the Junior Usher Board, Secretary and Secretary, board member of the Alfred A. Owens Jr. Family Life Community Center, and on and on it goes with all of these ministries. Vanessa is blessed to be a 15-year breast cancer survivor and three-year survivor of kidney cancer. It was during that time that another ministry began. After recuperating from breast cancer, Vanessa wanted to give back to women who were experiencing what she went through. So she started visiting women who were having mastectomies at the hospital where she spent so much time. She took the ladies a personalized teddy bear with words of encouragement and a CD with songs of encouragement. Vanessa participated in the Celebrate Life Foundation's Maryland pageant and won first runner up. She performed her first mime presentation to the song Still I Rise by Yolanda Adams and was offered to mime this in several states. Listen, this bio is extensive, but I do have to read this. Uh, because she is so family oriented. She will get me if I do not. Vanessa has been married to Thomas Antrim, her best friend and number one supporter for over 36 years. It is Thomas who advocated for her when she couldn't advocate for herself. He is a real co-survivor and now encourages men who are supporting their wives through the breast cancer journey. Her favorite job title is mom. She is the proud mother of four adult children, Devin, Michelle, Colleen, and Venice, my girls, and four granddaughters, Aria, Alasia, Aviada, and Emily Lee Antrim. Listen, we could go on and on and on, but I have to get that in there because she's so family oriented. So welcome to the Nicole Mason show. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much. 
So let's jump right in. Um, your bio really is extensive about, you know, having, um, you know, a career that spanned over 30 plus years, a marriage over 30 plus years, and um, talk about what it took to accomplish uh, those things, uh, the resilience that it took. Just, you know, someone may be listening saying, you know, yeah, uh, how do you do that? How do you sustain a career and a family and be successful at it? You know, it was nothing but God. And I'm not trying to be really spiritual, but when I look back on it to have four small kids and when I got married, I was 23 with two small kids and I just was very, very organized. And I still feel that that's the only way you can make it when you have multiple things that you are responsible for. So if it meant laying out the kids clothes for the whole week in that bottom drawer, I would have clothes for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So they knew they could go in and just pick out and it was all there together. You know, this is what mama wants you to wear. And sometimes we would, we would let them choose and everything, but pretty much everything was on that bottom drawer so that they could pull it out, easily get dressed. So having a time schedule, knowing what you had to accomplish and working towards those goals, because I've always felt that if you don't have a goal in mind, you're just going to be wasting time. So, you know, I knew that it was very hard to try to raise all these kids in different activities. I was very involved in ministry. And so I had to have a schedule. I had to have some goals. We're going to do this. And we had family talking, you know, this is what the plan is for this week. You know, this one has a basketball game. This one has a dance recital. This one has double dutch, you know. So it was just a lot going on. So I, um, I could not have done it alone because Thomas was really, really there with me. And um, I just smile when I think about him because he's just a, he's just a very good man. Did we have problems over those 38 years? Oh, you better bet it. <laughs> there were times when I wanted to walk away, never come back. But I thank God because our relationship is so much stronger today than it was. So. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And you know, I often tease you about uh, your the way that you respond whenever we talk about Thomas, and um, even in the magazine that you all were uh, able to, you know, be written about, uh, and your love, you know, you can just tell uh, just how much you adore him and how much he adores you, and you know, how important is it to for women to have their husband support when they are pursuing different goals, you know, starting with their career? It is really important, Nicole, because you need somebody that you can roll over and just talk about things in the middle of the night. This idea just came up, baby, I'm gonna need this amount of money. You know, I know we're short, but I'm willing to give up this. You know, it's like we're in this thing together. And when I go up, he goes up. He's like the wind beneath my wings. He's always been there to support me, um, being my cheerleader and taking pictures and everything. But um, you have to have that communication going with each other so that you know that you're sharing what your goals are. Because if you don't and you just pop out the blue, he used to say to me, Vanessa, you always have all these ideas, but you've been thinking about it. And then you come to me and you're like, Thomas, I want to do this. And I'm so excited. And he's like, okay, hold up, <laughs> you know, because he hasn't had that time. So I learned over the years that I have to give him time to digest what I want to do. Because as you say, when you started, I'm like you, I'm a mover and a shaker. What can I be doing now? How can I impact the world now? And so sometimes you have to get people on board with your goals and, and what you want to do. So I think communication is so important because you can have all these ideas and think the person isn't working with you, but maybe you just haven't explained to them where you want to go. And so once I started doing that and he was like, well, why don't we do this? And why don't we call it this? You know, even with the name of our business, I used to call it um, a and desktop services. He said, but you do so much more. And, you know, so let's expand that. And so um, that's, that's been our 
way of working things out. Mm-hmm. And I'm chuckling because, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, some, you know, the wives, we think that we have a corner on everything, but we come to know when we do communicate with our husbands that they too have some greatness inside of yes. them that if we allow them the opportunity to, you know, give us their opinion, <laughs> listen to what they have to say. Uh, and I can definitely relate to that because it's been my husband who really has pushed me. I'll even, you know, can think about going on social media. You know, I was late going onto social media because I just kind of rejected it. It was my husband's like, girl, you need to be on social media. So, you know, people mm-hmm. can find you. You know, you're preaching and you're writing and you're teaching and all those different kinds of things. People need to find you. It's not necessarily yeah. for you to be on there looking for somebody, but for people to find you. Um, he was also the one that encouraged me when I first started my show um, several years ago. He was also the one that encouraged me to get an app, you know, to encourage people. So all of these different things came out of just what you said, communicating what I was thinking, not necessarily an idea, but just something that I was thinking about Mm -hmm. and then offering what he thought would, would work and, you know, to give his um, recommendations as well. And so to that end, when you start thinking about communication, you know, share with, um, with the audience, just, you know, how your communication uh, with your husband has evolved over the years, because I know sometimes when you enter into a marriage, your communication, it doesn't start out all that great, but you know, how has it evolved and what are some of the recommendations that you would have for other wives, particularly maybe younger um, wives that are listening? And that's not always the case too, because sometimes people can be married for a long time and still don't know how to communicate. Um, But what are some of the recommendations uh, that you would offer to people who are listening and they may be struggling in their marriage right now? One of the first things I would do is to encourage women to listen, not only listen to the words that they're saying, but what their attitudes are saying. When he comes home, does his attitude change immediately? What is it that makes him happy when he comes in? So like with Thomas, when you come into our home, with Thomas, he wants the table clear. He doesn't want a whole bunch of stuff on the table. So I began to notice that when it was stuff laying on the table, we might come in, me and the girls come in and just dump stuff on the table, and purse here and coat on the back of the chair and our shoes right there. Uh Uh-uh. Mr. was not having it and it would change his whole attitude. So He's not one to complain, but we had to listen to what his actions were, you know, responding to. So you have to hear more than the words. You watch that nonverbal communication. And um, I think that that's so important because a lot of times we talk about couples communicating with each other, but it's more than just the talking. We want men to figure out what we want. And a lot of times we don't even know what we want. You know what I'm saying? It's like, what do you want for Christmas? I don't know. But then if he doesn't give you something that you think is worthy, then you're upset. But he already asked you what you wanted. And I don't know. So he doesn't know either. If you don't know what he wants, how does he know what you want? So I think um, starting off, I used to think he should be able to read my mind. You know, you should know. You know, you should know that I wanted this or wanted that. No, he doesn't. And um, it's like Sesame Street. Big Bird is going to tell you what the word is for the day. This is what I want. This is what I need. And not just in um, helping around the house, but I'm talking about in the bedroom, in the finances. You have to you have to communicate what your needs are because nobody can read that mind. Because I know my mind be all over the place sometimes. And I can't expect him to do that. So mm-hmm. I would say communicate, communicate, communicate and then show a little grace. I found that I was more lenient, so to speak, when some of my friends would offend me and say something that got on my nerves and I'd be like, oh, that's Jane, or oh, that's just how she is. But if he says something to offend me, 
girl, I will hold him to the wall, wouldn't speak for, <laughs> for days. You know, how dare you? Yeah. And I look back now, all the time we lost because I just didn't extend grace. The same way I extend grace to my friends, he is my first friend and I need to extend that same grace to him. So one day, one of my girlfriends got on my last nerve and I realized when I said, oh, that's just how she is, just let it go. Why can't I do that with Thomas? We do it with our supervisors. You know, that man get on your last nerve, but you come back in the next day, good morning, you know? But so I would say giving grace. And when you give grace, you receive grace. And so um, we can teach our husbands how to treat us if we treat them the way they want to be treated. So it's a give and take situation the whole time. So That's really awesome. And that's powerful, you know, that you would even bring that up, how we extend grace to others outside of the home. And when it comes to being inside the home, it's like, what, you know, uh, Sean and I've been together for 36 years this year. And, you know, I remember early on when we were married, I would just go around the house, not even talking, you know, yep. and that's why I learned there is a difference between the silent treatment and being silent. Those are two different things and they have two different energies along with them. And so yeah. I can relate to, you know, wasting time, but I also know that when you're, you know, early on and you're trying to figure it out, you know, working with your partner, uh, that that can be difficult. Uh, and so I really want to uh, turn my t attention now to the fact that, you know, your husband has been very gracious to you uh, in helping you to care for your parents. Yes, and yes. you've been uh, caring for them now for some time. And so I would like for you to talk about, you know, uh, how that came to be just your decision, you know, to care for them yourself in the home uh, that your husband helped you with. Uh, th the story is just phenomenal. So share that with us. Yeah, so um, Thomas has been great when it comes to my parents. I mean, well, my whole family, I mean, we have not just my inner family, I'm talking about nieces, nephews, sisters, brother. I mean, he has really been there. But um, I noticed several years ago, maybe about 10 years ago that my mom and dad were slowing down. And um, I, I was taking them to the grocery store one day and my dad put a Pepsi, one Pepsi in the cart. And my mother said to him, we, and we can't afford that. And I was like, Ma, a soda? He can't, you can't afford a soda? No, we got bills to pay. And I was like, wow. And so I started talking to her and what had happened, my dad and my mom were entrepreneurs from way back in the sixties. My mom owned her own beauty shop um, on third and between third and Rittenhouse and third and Sheridan near Coolidge High School. And um, my dad owned his own taxi cab. He wasn't just driving it, it was his. So whatever money he made, it was his. So when he drove that cab, he could bring in a lot of money during the week. So about 10 years ago is when he stopped driving the cab. And so their money was a little different. And um, when I looked, I said, they really don't have enough money to make ends meet. So Thomas and I would start helping them out just you know, buying the groceries this week or the next week, we might just give them a, a couple of hundred dollars. And um, so we then bought the house from my parents. And I told them, as long as we live, you will never have to pay anything to live in that home. And so um, I know it was important for my mom and dad, who really taught me the importance of family. We always went to visit aunts, you know, it was, it was always a big thing to be with family. So it's in me, you know, family is a big thing. And so when my parents got sick, my mom had a stroke first, my dad had a, had a stroke, then my dad broke his hip. And with my dad getting sick because he took care of my mom um, all her life, he spoiled her 
you know, my mother could be sitting there and say, William, I'm thirsty. Okay. And he'd get up and get her some water, you know? So, um, because he couldn't do that anymore, the dementia that was starting kicked in at a higher level. And so then when he got really sick and had to go in the hospital with a broken hip, and then he broke that same hip within 30 days um, at the rehab facility, she just started going downhill. And so it meant that me and my daughters, we had a schedule and everybody just took turns coming in at in the evenings and making sure that they were okay, having dinner and everything, cooking the whole nine yards. So it's just been, um, we've been in that home for years taking care of them. And so when my dad got really sick um, two years ago, right before the pandemic hit, and um, I decided, nope, I'm not gonna let you go back to that rehab. I'm gonna take care of you. I'll do the best I can um, taking care of you myself. And so we didn't have a lot of support, but that didn't matter. It was me and my kids and Thomas, and we were going to make this work to keep them happy in their final years. So they've been living at home. We were taking care of them. The pandemic hit. Okay, no caregivers. I'm moving in. So Thomas allowed me to, to just move in with my parents, and um, we took care of them for that whole time, and we're still taking care of them. Um, it's been a blessing, the relationship that, you know, just knowing that my mother and father know that they have, they have no worries for anything, that we're going to be there advocating for them, taking care of them, giving the best care that's possible. So I thank God that he allowed me the opportunity to be strong enough because it's hard. It's hard for uh, elderly person to be in a hospital and different people are coming in and changing you and whatever. But if you can imagine, you have to change your father, you know, I'm sure it's hard for him and it's hard for me to, you know, to do that. But I wouldn't have it any other way because I knew that I was going to keep him clean. My daughters were going to keep him clean. And, you know, so it, it wasn't any problem with bed sores and all this stuff, you know, people come and look at him and they say, oh, he looks so good. And it's like, what do you expect? We're we going to keep him looking good. And same thing with mama. So um, we celebrate them for everything, every milestone that they've made, um, their, their marriage years and everything. They've been married now for 73 years. And um, my mom is in rehab right now because... Um, she, she was falling a lot. And so my dad one night said, I got to get up out of this bed. And he's bedridden. I'm like, daddy, where you going? He's like, I got to go find Christine. So he knew that even through the dementia, he knew that he wasn't there. I mean, she wasn't there and he had to go find her. And I mean, so some things just touch your heart. My mom is really, really sick right now, but she knows me and the rehab people were like, I just want to know which one of y'all is Vanessa, because that's all she talks about is Vanessa, Vanessa. And when um, people came to, to um, work with my dad yesterday, he told my daughter, he said, go get my daughter. I need my daughter. Because he didn't know who the people were that were there. And it was like, he knows. So even in their diminished state, they know that Vanessa's gonna be there for them and I'm gonna advocate and care for them to the best of my ability. And so um, it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to take care of them. And I just wanna tell you this, Nicole, throughout the whole cancer thing and um, caring for my mom and dad and a lot of other things that I've had to go through, you know, um, we don't have to go there yet, but there is gonna be a time for that. But um, the Lord showed me one day that I was going to be like the Terminator. And I couldn't understand what that meant. But I, I remember watching that Terminator movie. And it was the scene where they, the one Terminator shooting at the other one. And the police officer kind of splits in half. And then he just comes right back together. And he keeps on. It doesn't miss a stride. And so the Lord has given me that resilience that all those things hit me and they hit me hard. And it's not that I don't have feelings, but I truly 
trust that he's going to keep me. They, when they said he won't give you more than, than you can bear, then obviously, Lord, you think I can handle this now. I know you think so, but it's getting hard. It's getting really hard, but I, I trust him. I have that mustard seed faith. So mm-hmm. sometimes when things look so bad, I just remember all I need is just that little bitty faith and he's going to bring me through. So um, I have to be there. Mom and dad were there for me. When I had my surgeries, they were right there. I would wake up and my dad would be sitting there. My mom would be sitting there. And um, I have to give back. And I don't, under, I don't understand people who don't do yeah. it, but it's not my issue. Yeah. My issue is to take care of William and Christine, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm going to do. And my daughters do the same thing. I mean, they are there, and we we fuss, fuss and fight over who's the favorite because <laughs> they want to think they're the favorite. I'm like, no, I am the favorite. I but, am their daughter, you know? So yeah. it it is a family. It's a family thing, and I couldn't do it without my husband and my daughters. Yeah. That is awesome and amazing. And I wanted you to share that story, just how your husband supports you and your daughters in helping to take care of your parents and just how powerful that is to be able to keep your parents at home versus, you know, putting them in a facility. And I know not everybody has the capacity to do that. We certainly acknowledge that. And we acknowledge that some people, you know, they are um, without the resources to do it, but Um, the fact that you have done it. And for people who can, uh, we encourage you to uh, follow suit and do likewise because it does make a difference. And I know you had the opportunity um, recently to write in a book, also to write in a magazine, just about your breast cancer survivor story. And for those who might be listening, um, as we begin to wind down our time, just talk a little bit about how you were able to survive mentally going through breast cancer treatments and um, that whole journey. Um, For those who might be listening, trying to figure out perhaps they just got a diagnosis or they know someone or they're in the midst of it, just what you did to help you along uh, in that journey really quickly. Okay, one of the things that I had to do was just prepare my mind. And I said, all of us are going to go somehow, some way. But just because somebody else passed because they had breast cancer doesn't mean that I'm going to have to have that same story. You know, my heart goes out. I've lost several aunts and friends um, to breast cancer. But I just I just said, God, I know you have more for me. And I held on to that one scripture they say, honor your mother and father that your days will be long. And I said, God, I know I did what you said. So I'm calling you on your word. And it could have been the other way, but I just thank God that he allowed me to be able to find the, the, um, the lump. Take care of yourselves, ladies. Go find out what's going on. If you feel something, go find out. You know, it's so much better. I used to navigate other women and try to help them get mammograms and assist them with getting free mammograms and other services. And one lady told me, I came in a world with two breasts and I'm leaving with two breasts. I looked at it differently and I told her this. I said, I thank God that it was on a part of my body that they could cut off and I could still live. You know, that's, that's not always the case. So yeah. me being without a breast, that doesn't take away who I am. It's just a part of my body that was defective that needed to go. When your car isn't working, you're not going to keep it because you had it forever. If it's not doing what it needs to do, you either get it fixed or you get another one. So you know what? (laughs) I was blessed with another breast. So, you know, there are things that can happen. So I, I really think that positive thinking is not what happens to you. It's how you handle what happens to you. So... That's good. Uh, That's powerful. And, you know, the time goes by so quickly when we're having these great conversations. But I really want you to tell people how they can get in contact with you, find out more about the books you've written, the magazines you've been a part of. How can they find you? Well, you can find me at VanessaKAntrum.com. And that is V as in victory, A-N- 
as in Nancy, E-S-S-A. The middle initial is K. And my last name is A, N as in Nancy, T as in Tom, R, U, M as in Mary, dot com. Excellent. So, yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for being a guest on the Nicole Mason Show. And thank I want to thank you all for tuning in and join us again for another powerful episode of the Nicole Mason Show.